sheriff's office suddenly is ready to settle an excessive force complaint against a deputy who's now prominently accused of murder. Club Q survivors tell Congress about the connection between hateful words and deadly violence. A billionaire accused of a massive fraud has boosted Democrats in Colorado. Claims he secretly funneled money to Republicans, too. We're unveiling an extensive project documenting the Marshall Fire from every angle through the eyes of the people who were there. It was so intense. It was just something unbelievable. A surprise that isn't horrible. Sure, we'll take it. It's this woman's hidden away project to spread kindness. And there are about 4,000 kids in Colorado in need of a holiday gift. I bet you we can check a bunch of them off the list tonight. I'm next. The Clear Creek County deputy accused of murder for the death of a man who called 911 for help has a history of questionable decisions. One of them is going to cost that county, which is now ready to settle an excessive force case. Here's Steve, Steve Stager with the story and the video. On May 15th, 2019, in the hallway of the Clear Creek County Jail, Manuel Camacho is about to appear in court in Georgetown on charges of vehicular eluding. A deputy puts handcuffs on Camacho. He attempts to put leg restraints on him. And according to a lawsuit Camacho filed, he has some permanent swelling in his left leg. So he asks the deputy to get a bigger restraint. This is when Deputy Andrew Buin starts to approach from the left of your screen. Let's pause for a moment and remind you, Buin is currently facing second-degree murder charges for the shooting death of Christian Glass this summer. In an affidavit about this case, Buin claims Camacho turns toward him in a threatening manner. Then he takes him to the ground. There's no audio on the video, so it's hard to tell what either man says. Mr. Camacho was handcuffed. He was restrained. When an individual is handcuffed, there is a duty of care by the officers around them. Siddhartha Rathod is representing Christian Glass's family, but is not involved in this case. He wants to talk about this because he believes it shows a pattern about Buin. Only Officer Buin took it upon himself to grab and take to the ground by the head this restrained and handcuffed inmate. When Camacho filed a complaint with the sheriff's office about the hallway takedown, he says he told detectives he didn't want to press charges, but he wanted the issue handled administratively. According to records we've requested about Buin, he faced no discipline. Attorneys for the county and the deputies involved in this case indicated Tuesday they are ready to pay Camacho a settlement. What the video demonstrates and what the settlement demonstrates is that Clear Creek County knew that Officer Buin was violent, aggressive, and should not have been on the force. And the end result of their failure to discipline him, their failure to take appropriate action against him was the murder of Christian Glass. Now the county got back to me today, said they won't be able to comment on the size of the settlement until it's approved by the court. The attorneys for Buin and the other deputies in this case had no comment about the settlement. Camacho is currently in prison on an unrelated case, so we were unable to get in touch with him about the settlement in this case. This is, a, this is a 2019 incident, and just now the county's like, ah, yeah, we'll, we'll pay you. A long time ago, and this guy has been representing himself from prison. He's had no attorney. He filed this case based on a grievance. He says that he wanted to see something done to the deputies who were involved in this, and when he followed back up, they said, oh, well, we can't tell you if anything happened administratively, so we decided to file the lawsuit. Mm. Uh, it's dragged on and on and on, and you have to think, why are they settling this case? This isn't the most sympathetic of characters in the world. I mean, he's, he's been in and out of prison his whole life. Uh, there must have been something with this video and maybe some of the attention that Clear Creek County is getting right now that may have kind of led this case forward. Me thinks you might have figured it out. Steve, thank you. Club Q survivors told Congress today that hate speech turns into hateful actions, and that's when people die. They described the rise in anti-LGBTQ violence as a human rights issue for our country. A House committee is looking at the connection between anti-LGBTQ rhetoric and violent attacks. Well, Club Q owner Matthew Haynes and shooting survivor James Slaw were there on Capitol Hill today. They described the shooting as a targeted attack, and they raised concerns about far-right rhetoric falsely painting the trans community and drag performers as somehow grooming children for, for pedophilia. Club Q bartender Michael Anderson also testified before Congress today, called on them to pass a ban on so-called assault weapons. When I stared down the barrel of that gun, I realized I stood no chance against a weapon of that power 
magazine capacity, and seemingly automatic firing rate. I want to thank President Biden for fighting to reinstate the assault weapons ban, and I sincerely hope you will support that reform so that we may try to prevent more people from needlessly dying. An assault weapons ban is not likely to pass in a divided Congress. It stands a better chance in Colorado at the state level where Democrats run the whole show. The real question is whether Democratic Governor Jared Polis would sign an assault weapons ban. He voted for one at one point in Congress, but Polis has been vague on the issue lately. A crypto billionaire arrested this week had donated to some Colorado Democrats. A grand jury indictment says that money used for political donations was stolen from investors. Sam Bankman Fried is the co-founder of a now bankrupt cryptocurrency company, FTX. He was arrested Monday, indicted on fraud charges. In the years leading up to his arrest, he and his family made millions of dollars in on-the-record donations to Democratic legislators and PACs. As first reported by Colorado Public Radio, that included thousands of dollars to Senator John Hickenlooper and Representatives Joe Neguse and Brittany Patterson here in Colorado. Prosecutors allege that Bankman Freed also made a similar level of dark money contributions to Republican causes. And Bankman Freed himself bragged about secretly funding Republicans during a recent interview. Spokesperson for Senator Hickenlooper says that they'll be donating the $3,000 given to Hickenlooper's PAC to a victim's compensation fund or to charity. Patterson and Goose's office told CPR that they either have or will donate that money. City of Denver is expanding its operation to house hundreds of migrants unexpectedly showing up from the southern border in recent weeks. The city converted one rec center into temporary housing. Now it's going to add two more. 300 or so migrants have arrived, and the city does not know how many more to expect or when. The migrants have told city workers that they coordinated their own trips here from cities like El Paso, Texas. The city's been asking faith groups, nonprofits, and other private organizations to help with the housing effort if they can by contacting Denver's Emergency Operations Center. There is an organization in our community that will provide more than 13,000 holiday gifts for kids in Colorado this year. 13,000 gifts. That is astonishing, both in terms of the scale of the need and also what that nonprofit, A Precious Child, can accomplish. Here's the issue, though. They have their list of 13,750 kids covered, but now another 4,000 children in need have been referred to their emergency list. That's where your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign comes in. You pulled this off last year for children in our community. We're going to do it again. A Precious Child serves kids all over the metro area and up into northern Colorado. And a major focus of their work, and they do a lot of things, but a major focus is gifts. Birthday gifts and holiday gifts. Because they know that a gift tells a child that they are loved, that they are remembered. 4,000 kids on that last minute emergency gift list is a lot. These names have come in at the last minute from, from schools, from shelters, from other service providers, they identify kids that they're concerned might go without a gift this holiday season. So a Precious Child is going to try to get as many gifts as possible with whatever we can raise together here. Scan the QR code on your screen to get that link to donate, or you can find it on any of Next social media accounts. You all have proven that $5 matters. So I'll match the first 50 people to donate $5 as always. It's staggering to think that so many thousands of kids in Colorado might not get a holiday gift this year. It's also hopeful to think that we might be able to buy that gift for thousands of them. They escaped the Marshall Fire and captured a record of a wildfire like never before in this state. I felt like I just needed to record it. And one woman is on a mission to prove kindness is everywhere. If you know where to look, that's next. Colorado's worst, most destructive wildfire also happened to be the state's most documented natural disaster. Tens of thousands of people evacuating, and tons of them taking videos. As we approach the one-year mark of the Marshall Fire, we want to show you a bit of what evacuees saw that day. Look, guys, it's burning up. I'm going to turn off my AC. It was just something unbelievable. I was in the middle of a city that we don't really see a wildfire happening in. I felt like I just needed to record it. This is insane, bro. Insane. I've never seen something like this, bro. What the fudge? It was so intense. It was just something unbelievable. Look at that. Just look at that. I should not have opened the window. <laughs> yeah, as I drove out, I made a stop right here behind these charging stations and took a video. 
of kind of the fires coming this way. I know this area a little bit well, so I knew that everyone was leaving the store at that time. I knew that everything was going to get blocked off god. east of here. Oh my god! Holy <laughs> This is in Superior, guys, right now, in Boulder. I tried to find alternative routes through here. Um, my best bet was to go, uh, what is it, westbound, and then try to just take the highway or try to take the off ramp off the highway. Um, there wasn't a sign of a fire, just a lot of smoke. Uh, but as I was going that way, the smoke thickened up really, really intensively. I couldn't really see anything. God help us right now. God help us. Holy f Holy f Holy f Holy f Holy f Did you guys just see that? Holy f I, I cursed a lot in the video. Um, I, I, I think I was in a moment of kind of shock. <laughs> Uh, it's just something that you don't see every day and for me I think that was the one way to release my energy that I was feeling inside and just let it all out and uh, not cry not overwhelm myself I need to be okay to drive so just yelling and cursing maybe <laughs> helped relieve that originals team has spent months gathering hundreds of videos all in an effort to show you just how fast these things can turn the website itself is live now. Head to it at marshallfiremap.com. It can tell you where and when that fire burned. And most importantly, it can show you just how fast it moved that day, a problem that has implications for hundreds of thousands of people living all along the Front Range. Kyle. Chris, I imagine for some people, this is going to be their first look at what the fire looked like in their neighborhood because they were at work, they weren't home, whatever else, but somebody else was there. And you guys have put together this enormous ream of documentation where you can look at the fire by location, by time, that sort of thing. Yeah, 650 videos in all, security cameras, body cameras, cell phone cameras. Everybody has a camera these days and that captured it really in sort of a minute by minute, location by location experience so that people can see what happens when an urban firestorm moves into the suburbs. Just got a note in from an ex viewer, Judy Watson, who says this project's going to be invaluable for fire districts nationwide to help them understand urban wildfires. What is your hope for, for, the, for this project? It's really that, to really help educate people what these fires can turn. Because everybody that sort of tells the same story, they had a 10 or 15 minutes where they see a little bit of puff of smoke off in the distance, and then all of a sudden that puff of smoke moves very, very quickly. Grass fires move very, very quickly. And when they start to interact with the suburbs, with houses and with other buildings, it changes the dynamic completely. Chris, thank you. You bet. Well, weather's starting to calm down out there after a very active evening yesterday, especially across the northeastern plains. But right now at DIA, we're at 32 degrees, cloudy skies, but dry. We see uh, winds coming in from the south-southwest at around 5 miles per hour, making it feel closer to 27 degrees out there. That very large system that has passed us by, still sweeping northeastern corners of the state, though, has made its way further north and east here. But as you take a look in Colorado, we do just have some light lingering showers in portions of the plains and then off into the western slope there coming through Grand Junction, but we are going to continue to clear out and dry out as we go through the rest of the evening and certainly into the day tomorrow. So through the rest of the day, we do still have avalanche warnings that will be in effect. That's going to be Park Range, Medicine, Bone Mountains, Never Summer Mountains, and Northern Front Range. We're going to continue to monitor those backcountry areas through the rest of the evening. Now, in the meantime, partly cloudy skies here in Denver, lows near 15 degrees, and we have a chilly stretch of weather ahead. We stay in the lower 30s through the rest of the week, low 40s for the weekend, then we're we're back in the 30s as we start the next work week. They don't call it a truck stop for nothing. 24 hours later, and the same guys we talked to yesterday are still stuck, turning over a rock and finding kindness. It's just sort of a way to pay it forward in love. Hidden words of encouragement all over town. Next. There are a bunch of truckers in northeastern Colorado who have now spent nearly two full days going nowhere. Yesterday, we introduced you to drivers waiting out the blizzard at a truck stop on I-76. We went back today and found them exactly where we left them. I-76 and many of the roads in northeastern Colorado are still closed after the storm, and there are not convenient detours, especially for trucks. So what do you do for two days inside a small truck that's not moving? The same guys we talked to yesterday told us they're still watching movies, they're refreshing the weather app. They've learned you can really only nap so much in a day. 
From here to inside of the truck stop, that's all I moved. Truck stayed the same spot. I haven't moved a centimeter. So nothing's changed at all. I wish we had something more exciting to talk about, but this is it. It's cool. That's it. It's part of the deal, part of the job. CDOT tells us it's not just Colorado having issues. They don't want to open the interstate out to the Nebraska line until the roads in Nebraska are also clear. There are as many truck stops out east, so they would rather have the truckers at a safe spot with some services until they know the roads are clear. Next time you're walking around Denver, take a look around, and you might find some encouragement where you least expect it. The Kindness Rocks Project encourages people to use something as small and simple as a rock to spread joy. We are in downtown Denver. I'm Marcy Lundy. I am the founder of Kindness Rocks in the City. So Kindness Rocks in the City is just sort of a way to pay it forward in love. Painting rocks and writing words of encouragement or just painting bright, beautiful rocks to catch people's attention. And what I think is special about doing it downtown is, you know, it's the heart of the city. People are busy moving and so to look around and you suddenly see this bright kindness rock or something that says be kind on it in the heart of the city you don't really think that you'll see something like that so that kind of adds to the fun of it i very much love being artsy fartsy i am not necessarily a grand painter but you know <laughs> i hope that people find joy in it it brings me joy to create them and place them in the world. So I actually have one that's supposed to emulate a Christmas bulb, and that's the one I will be setting out. <laughs> Maybe just a little off the beaten path of the mall, just because I try to be very discreet. <laughs> if you feel inclined to take it, please do, you know? <laughs> so literally someone just picked it up while I was talking to you. <laughs> which is pretty awesome. That's the mission, just something to make people smile. And it is that easy. Isn't that cool? How can you not help but smile when a person picks up the rock and looks at it? Marcy Lundy started the project in 2019, says so she's inspired by a similar project in Massachusetts. Since then, she figures she's hidden somewhere between 300 and 500 rocks. Hey, so this week, we, like, like you and me, we, are helping provide holiday gifts for kids who might otherwise go without. Pretty decent way to spend a Wednesday. That and your feedback next. The nonprofit A Precious Child takes on this enormous project every holiday season, getting gifts for thousands upon thousands of kids in need in Colorado. This year, 13,000 gifts. And then inevitably, schools and homeless shelters and other groups call up the nonprofit to ask if they can add more names, more children who might not receive anything for the holidays. So A Precious Child creates an emergency list, and that's where we can help. Scan the QR code on your screen to get the link to join me in donating. Right now, A Precious Child's emergency list has 4,000 names on it. They want to get these kids gifts because they know that a gift tells a child that they are loved. And they know how important that is, especially for a child in need. 4,000 kids is a lot, but we're going to do our best with that. A feedback tonight comes in from John Ebel head of Culture of Life Colorado. He wanted to talk about journalism then and now. John Ebel says that the classic Nine News newscaster Carl Akers did journalism. I'm not sure what My Little Pony, a.k.a. Kyle Clark, does. I love this because my girls are going to get into My Little Pony in just a little bit, and to find out that, that a grown man in town was kind enough to bespoke me with that nickname, my girls are going to love that, John. Wait till they hear their dad is My Little Pony. Awesome. See you next time.